And now to the former West introductory notes. So Charles is joining me at the lectern, and the floor is yours for a while. Um, thanks, Maria. Thanks a lot. And um, uh, the, the thanks uh, go without saying towards you as well for having initiated the whole thing and started it off. Um, I would also like to welcome you all, as Maria did, and um, to hope uh, that the next three days will be rich days, full of discussion, but also decisions, in a sense, about what former West means. We need, over this uh, following uh, three years of the project, um, to actually decide what we mean by this term. At the moment, it's still open. It's, uh, it's a sort of open vessel. Um, I think that's why it's so appealing to people. But gradually, it will become defined, and people will start to resist. That's the natural course of events. But I think that resistance has also to start now, as we start to exclude, as well as, as, well as include, what former West might mean. As Maria has said, our intentions as curators of this extended research project is to construct a broad stage for, the investigation, for investigating the place of Western Europe, and to some extent North America and Japan, in the world since the pivotal year 1989. We also hope that various academic disciplines will be attracted to the frame of former West and find it useful as a trope through which to look at recent developments in their own specialisms. I think that this former West has not clearly not only affected or been played out on the field of aesthetics and in the field of contemporary art, but it's been clearly been played out in many other fields from law and justice through to social policy and, and, and governmentality. Um, we ourselves, however, will explore the various openings and closures in ethics and aesthetics and the crossover between the two as they have emerged in the art field over this period. In order to do so, we would now like to perform something of a double act uh, in order to use these, uh, the introductory words uh, which we have defined, such as former West, 1989, etc., to draw a mental map, if you will, through, of, of our preliminary thoughts about the subjects at hand. This map will gradually reveal itself before your eyes, a drawing of a certain way of thinking that seeks to understand the possibility of art to observe and shape a response to what is happening. The intention is also to open up potential discussions around some of the terms that will be most frequently cited in the next days and throughout the former West project. These terms reveal a little of the background to our processes of thinking and developing the project up to this point in the hope that they can be further interrogated with you in the coming days. Former West is something of a hybrid project, a research into art through the lens of world events and world events through the lens of, lens of art. This basic glossary that we will very soon reveal is then an attempt to mark a territory as a way to construct space from which to act together. A call to attention, if you will, about certain facts on the ground and a way of discovering how we might agree or disagree about the trajectories in which we find ourselves caught up. We have made, in our thinking, not only in this talk, but generally, of many of the ideas explored in the work and writings of the contributors to this Congress. And I'm delighted and privileged that so many good people have said yes to this invitation. Today we will have the pleasure of listening to Sarat Maharaj, Boris Groys, Renata Salatzal, and hopefully Paul Gilroy. And I believe we could not wish for four more appropriate and significant think thinkers in the broad field today. It also falls to me to introduce our, what the reviewer of our Congress, Jeroen Bomgaard, who is sitting there, uh, who is an art historian and art critic. He is currently Professor of Art and Public Space at the Gerald Rietveld Academy and Head of Masters of Artistic Research at the University of Amsterdam. Bomgaard also directs the research group Art and Public Space a partnership between the Gerald Reitford Academy, the Sandberg Institute, the University, the University of Amsterdam, and the Virtuele Museum Zaudas, it's half in Dutch, this, which stimulates research and theoretical reflection on the role of art and design in the public domain. He regularly writes articles about art and public space for publications such as Open, Cahier on Art and the Public Domain. He lives and works in Amsterdam. And Jeroen's role will be as reviewer, there are three reviewers actually for each day, a different one, and his review, uh, role is to um, write, um, it, fairly soon after this Congress ends, uh, a, a summary of uh, the events of the day uh, in order to provide us with a way of recalling what has happened uh, uh, this day for the future, but also hopefully a stimulant to continue the discussion further beyond these next three days. So thank you very much, Jeroen. Now give me great pleasure to reintroduce Maria for the first of our mind map definitions. I need to always step uh, up. 1989, so what is it that happened in 1989? <laughs> However naive this question might 
sound in the framework of this gathering, as I assume that all of us here agree that that year full of aspiration and anguish transformed our world forever, the meaning of the year 1989 remains strikingly unacknowledged in most of what we intuitively refer to as the West. Germany and perhaps to some extent Austria might be, for obvious reasons, exceptions to this rule. But if we take the Netherlands as the example of the West, the notion of the example used here in Giorgio Agamben's sense as, quote, one singularity among others which stands for each of them and holds for all, unquote, we see that 1989 and its dramatic consequences for the planet are absolutely not part of the West's consciousness. If recognized at all, then the 1989 events are seen as something that happened over there, behind the Iron Curtain in the East. Yet the Berlin Wall faced both the East and the West. And so one has to think of the impact of its fall on 9 November that year in at least those two directions. As much as this monumental political event represented the end of communist rule in Europe's East and was heralded as a global triumph for capitalist uh, democracy, it also caused unimagined political, social, economic and culture changes in the so-called West. Yet what we know as the West has continued over the last 20 years to imagine its unchanged state and its unaltered hegemony, and to this day fails to recognize the extent of the transformations in the world order ushered in by 1989. It seems that despite the indisputable significance of uh, the 1989 events, the Western political and cultural imagination is held hostage by another year, this one, 1968, though more by May in Paris than what the Prague Spring came to symbolize, of course. Yet even if the number 68 and 89 resemble one another uh, visually as mirror images, in fact, they are radically different. If 1968 by in large represents the struggle for individual liberties, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and socialism was a human face, as it were, 1989 represents the case of the unglamorous fight for everyday democracy and consumerism, which, although already available in the West, resulted in the end of a perverse <coughs> Cold War stability and unleashed an avalanche of critical shifts on a planetary scale. The fall of the Berlin Wall <coughs> with the other revolutions that swept through the communist countries in 1989-1990 is undoubtedly the most spectacular event of 1989 and stands here as a symbol for the dramatic point, uh, breaking point that ushered in another future. It also gave birth to what we so unproblematically call the former East, identifying the political geography of what used to be the so-called socialist states. And thus it also gave an impetus to us in the construction of the category former West, which we work with in order to help us to rethink the West away from its own hegemonic self-narrative, to which it tirelessly clings despite the breaking point two decades ago that introduced to the world a radically new condition. Yet if the fall of the Berlin Wall is a useful anchor for our considerations, it certainly is not the only thing we must consider. The true history-making significance of 1989 for our time and age can only be understood by taking into account a massive, massive patchwork of many other interrelated events that occurred all around the world that year and on every continent. The synthetic history of the year 1989 is yet to be written, admittedly something that the former West project cannot single-handedly do. But consider only this partial and necessarily incomplete list. The Tiananmen Square massacre in China, the death of Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran, the fatwa issued against the writer Salman Rushdie for, for his controversial book, The Satanic Verses, the withdrawal of Soviet troops from Afghanistan, and the, of course, subsequent changes that this move had in the Middle East and Central Asia, the end of a number of South African, Af American dictatorships, the withdrawal of Cuban troops from Angola, Namibia's independence, and the first face-to-face -face meeting between Nelson Mandela and the clerk in South Africa that led to the end of apartheid but also the airing of the first um, reality TV show, for example, 
or the opening of Magicians de la Terre in Paris, the first exhibition that set out to show on an equal footing artists from both Western and non-Western traditions, initiating a long-lasting wave of critical exhibition practices active up to our own, own day. Besides the abundance of the political, military and ideological shifts that 89 brought about, that year kicked off a cascade effect of new transnational processes, the consequences of which we still struggle to come to terms with. Think of what we call globalization, its causes and its impact on literally every field of our activity and existence, not only in terms of economic interconnectedness, but also in the globe-spanning meshing of cultures and communities and new questions around migration and citizenship that this raises. Then the notion of the return of religion and the rise of religious extremism, arguably a direct consequence of the end of the communist rule in the large part of the world. Or the impact of technology, the massive use of personal computers virtually non-existent 20 years ago, but perhaps more importantly, the invention and availability of the World Wide Web launched in March 1989 <coughs> in Geneva, which radically reshaped our way of communicating and being together in the world. Indeed, one could go on and on. Only when we recognize this larger picture of how the world has changed dramatically in that year can we see how 1989 was a decisive moment in the history of the 20th century and one with planetary consequences. But we, of course, need to ask ourselves, what is it that we have in mind when we speak of the West. If you can, that'd be great. You can take that. Should I leave? No. <laughs> so the West, after 89, or the West before 89, because the West is not a single monolith, nor has its definition stayed fixed historically. At times, the West has been used simply as a substitute for the term civilization, describing self-consciously a concept of its own culture and its artifacts. This was, is, the West of imperial domination, one that is associated irretrievably for the rest of the world with conquest and plunder. This imperial West overwhelmed, but didn't eliminate another older idea of a Christian West, constituted out of the Eastern and Western Roman empires and extending beyond the Renaissance. This Christian West saw itself in a competition for souls and for military power with other perceptions of the world that, while intolerable to it, had to be addressed because they carried a genuine threat to its survival, the survival of the West. These two other definitions, then, the Christian West and the Imperial West, sit rather uneasily alongside the West to which we predominantly refer. They sit uneasily, but they exist as kind of specters behind the West of post-1945. This was a West that was reconfigured in the face of fascist defeat and communist advance after 1945, and reconfigured in terms of a first, second, and third worlds, membership of, membership, membership of which was determined in part by economics and in part by ideology, or in part by wealth, we could say. Not by economic system, but by how much wealth you had. And by ideology, with two absolutely antagonistic camps and a minority non-aligned mo movement opened or permitted to a few. These various Wests, these three Wests, and I think they could be multiplied, but they seem to be the three key ones that we need to deal with when we talk about anything like the former West, each have their own definitions of cultural authority exhibited through the production of certain representations that distinguished and clarified what Western values were for both their internal and external audiences. Thus, Christian art is followed by forms of imperial artistic production that profoundly shape the origins of modernism and the development of modernism. In these developments, the complexity of the most interesting artworks always point to the ambivalent relationship between the West and what we have called the non-West in the past, a fascinating entanglement with each other that plots almost subconscious interdependencies while frequently asserting unique, ideal, and universal values. The latest, post-1945 West, was bound in particular forms of political antagonism with its rival. Officially, it maintained a static balance of terror through the, through the doctrine of mutually assured destruction, while fighting proxy wars of influence far from home soil. 
This military logic was accompanied by active competition in terms of social policy and artistic creation. Defenders of Western art, when discussing contemporary practices, praised the radical innovation of the artist's choices and sought out forms of so-called autonomous production or sought to value forms of so-called autonomous production that demonstrated the extent to which aberrant or oppositional forms were possible in democratic governmental regimes. In return, the post-45 East which was built on very similar imperial Western foundations to the West as it became after 45, but with a different critique of those values, also defined its distinction in part in aesthetic terms. Officially, it controlled its art to ensure proletarian understanding and rejected formalist experimentation as bourgeois affectation, while still sharing most of a historic European narrative. So this meant that when the New East of post-45 becomes the former East, post-89, most of the shared cultural concepts on both sides of the European divide, at least, were awkwardly reunited in ways that are still not fully understood. So what this formerness of West and East is also a re-coming together in terms of a, of, a, of a historical discourse, which was very similar, though obviously with very particular national nuances, in the past. In the West, meanwhile, in this period 45 to 89, the critiques of feminism, post-colonialism, anti-racism, and many others, and I'm not going to list them all, but you know what they are, had also meant that a significant intellectual and artistic minority in the West had been in necessarily self-critical mode. The horrors of colonialism and fascism in Europe had to be seen as products of the West's wider, or have to be seen as products of the West's wider cultural heritage, however mitigated they might be by its Enlightenment achievements. In attempting to convert these critiques into radical artistic practices, artists opened up new terrains, media, and conditions of authorship that expanded the field of art enormously. Equally, conservative commentators, while remaining rigorous in their defense of free expression and autonomy, also criticized the West post-1945 cultural development. They complained about the loss of traditional values and even the commercialization of art. And in this way, they parallel almost a, a progressive critique that observes a West in cultural decline, a sense of cultural decline that I think in some ways survives the drama of 1989. And thus, might mis and thus it might be misunderstood that the concept former West suggests the decay of a more glorious version of an imagined past. Now, just to be clear, that isn't the West and that isn't the formerness of the West that we're referring to or wish to discuss or investigate. Rather, we are informed by a desire for a more useful and accurate understanding of Western Europe's place in the entangled global culture that has emerged post-1989. In this sense, it seems more appropriate to describe the perceived victory of the West as simply stepping into a vacuum created by an eternal collapse in the East. So no victory, or a victory by default. The West in 1989 was not then triumphalist in the way it later portrayed itself. And it was certainly not prepared for its new world role. And it was interesting, uh, there was an a, a interview with Gorbachev quite recently in The Nation, um, and where he spoke about the, 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 the tragedy, and he spoke obviously in, to some extent in self-justification, but he spoke about the way that, in, it, he referred specifically to America, but I think it extends to Western Europe, that, the, that 1989 was never seen as a, as a challenge to change in the way that it was elsewhere. But in fact, change was as necessary, and this was his argument, that if the Soviet Union had survived and changed and democratized itself, then change might have happened on both sides. But the collapse of the Soviet Union and the filling of this vacuum after the collapse meant that there was no challenge to change. And I think that's the key in some way to understand at least the initial impetus to declare something like the West to be former, to actually state that the change has happened. This unconsciousness of the change that happened in 89, which we didn't know about, proved very significant in subsequent years, we being people in the West, subsequent years, because rather than the West as, West as a value system, it was economic globalization or world integrated free trade or whatever we call it, simply profiteering, we could say, in many cases in the former East, that were the de facto winners of the Cold War. Thus, the rapid growth of globalization following reforms in China, as well as in the post-Soviet sphere, radically changed the map and identity of the West without the, the latter having any clear sense of how and why it had come about. Or indeed, even if that transition of form into formerness was taking place at all. And now, in lead-up to formerness, I introduce Maria. <laughs> 
To declare this West to be former is provocative. Clearly, former West is a citation of the former East, the term that is used to account for the events and political geography after 1989 of what used to be the Soviet or communist bloc in the decades before. Yet it also rhymes with other formers, an incomplete list of which would include former empires, former colonies, former totalitarian, former fascist, former communist, and so forth. These are specters at the feast of the contemporary that shape its debates and still define its possible horizons. Equally, the use of former is cognate with the pre prefix post, which has dominated recent debates in philosophy and culture studies. From postmodernism onwards, the use of either former or post does not represent an end to a condition, but rather a radical and possibly still disputed transformation in status and identity. Thus, former and post do not mean exclusively past. As much as they suggest, suggest a chronological or temporal designation, equally importantly, they mark the a rupture between two epistems and delineate the point of a turn in intellectual history while taking up themselves a radically critical dimension. The former condition is meaningful because it still has some power over the imagination in the present. And though it seems to have passed into history, it calls to mind a way of thinking that carries the possibility for understanding what is going on now. Formerness then reaches out from the past to home parts of the present, at times through a rhetoric of lost possibilities and unfulfilled events, at times as a break on progressive change. It should be remembered that this was not meant to happen. After 1989, the now dominant neoconservatives tried to put ideological and social struggle into an archive box labeled the end of history, claiming in the words of Francis Fukuyama, what we may be witnessing, quote, is the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government, unquote. The competition for ideas was to be replaced with the eternal victory of economic pragmatism, where free markets produce free men, significantly not framed the other way around, and put simply, whatever sells in the market is good for society. While doubts in this absolutism soon emerged, the fundamentalist free market ideology casts a long shadow, which has radically affected the world at large, including, of course, the production and distribution of art. But if the West is declared former, what happens under the influence of this shadow? And what kind of critical thinking emerges in this period of absolute capitalist hegemony? No? Yes. These questions are at the very core of our artistic and intellectual inquiry, of course. Yet one answer seems to be a matter of consensus already at the onset of our work that the condition of the world today is bereft of any horizon, of any perspective or radically new direction towards which to strive. The avant-garde prospect of a better world was written off overnight as an outmoded, laughable claim and replaced readily with the endgame of liberal democracy and practices of administration with the goal not to change the world, but to make it work pragmatically for one's immediate needs. Yet, what is left to submit to this regime of management after 20 years of its application? If 1989, it could be argued, introduced in the West the feeling of victory over, over the only serious ideological and economic alternative, if only by default, on September 11, In 2001, the West sense of itself shifted from one of benevolent conquer to that of vulnerable targets, subject to sudden and terrifying attacks on its symbolic institutions. It is therefore ironic that what could be called the long decade between 89 and 2001 ended as it had begun to the sound of falling masonry. Yet this neat coincidence hides the fact that underlying, underlying changes were in evidence throughout the period not the least of which was a growing awareness that the post-1945 West, Western Europe, the United States and Japan, would not necessarily share the same interests forever. The world after 2001 witnessed the resurrection of the rhetoric of us versus them in the former West, strongly echoing the Cold War narrative of friend and foe. However, the identity of the enemy is now maddeningly complex, 
caught up in the intricacies of religious, uh, national, and cultural divisions across borders and within the societies of the former ones themselves. While these processes of constructing and reacting to an unstable global order, order are already underway, perhaps another symbolic date can be added to our recent chronology. 15 September 2008, the date when the New York headquarters of the global financial services firm Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy protection, the largest ever such filing in the U.S. history. As Renata Salatzel has pointed out, a quick erosion of the concept of money, a close to sacred foundation of the free market followed with breathtaking speed and is causing not only economic but also psychological trauma to citizens convinced of the absolute reliability of the capitalist system. Today, most of the world finds itself amidst the most severe economic contraction, accelerating what one could hope, the awareness and possibility of the need for the West to rethink itself and its relations. To help ourselves in articulating the complexity of the processes we're looking at when we declare the West to be former, a brief detour into a concrete example of an artwork is instructive. In one of their most recent works from 2009, the collective of artists, critics, philosophers and writers Stodelat, echoing in their name the famous What is to be done writings of Chernyshevsky and Lenin, incorporated a wall drawing reflecting on the potential of political projects for social emancipation in the case of Soviet perestroika. Included is a summary of what has happened, followed by a hypothetical parallel chronology entitled What Might Have Happened. The latter, the what if list, involves imaginaries such as, I quote, the Soviet Union is transformed into a federative state based on broad, broad autonomy of republics, districts and cities, and workers take full control of all factories and enterprises, or government fully disarm and unite to create a fund to ensure the future of the planet. But also, the West undergoes its own version of perestroika. Inspired by the processes underway in a renewed Soviet Union, Western societies carry out a series of radical social democratic reforms. It might be that this work articulates something latent in the project former West, which is a delayed and symbolic proposition to imagine and articulate the West's own version of perestroika and perhaps even glasnost. It is here, in a concrete work framing or responding to an abstract concept, that the field of contemporary artistic production can find its critical position. By producing trenchant critique of the contemporary moment that is at once disclosing the status quo and proposing how our political and social futures can be reimagined, art actualizes a crucial part of its potential. It is precisely this, setting up a horizon in a horizonless world, if you will, replacing the aimless wandering with a sense of possibility of a new direction that former West wants to establish with and from the field of art, both poetically and politically. But let us have a closer look at the question of art itself. So, why art? Well, the research question that broadly defines our remit is how art has described, reflected on, and even instigated certain internal, social, and cultural dynamics in or about the territories of the former West. So there's your answer, it's because that's our subject. But why would we choose art? Let's imagine we weren't all embedded in this art world, but we had a choice of where we could look at the conditions. Why would we choose art? as the means to view this territory of the last 20 years. What is it about art that makes it crucial for this particular exercise? Does the application of such a filter, a trope, the trope of art, not limit the field of free expression in art and limit us in our discoveries? What do the mostly individualistic responses of artists, mostly individualistic, to conditions around them have to tell us about these broader dynamics anyway? It's a big question, I think. It's a question that we spend a few thousand years trying to answer in some way. 
and there are no elementary answers or certainties about the arts predisposition to be the form through which these issues can be explored, but they need to be the subject. Art remains a unique uh, category of knowledge or non-knowledge production, as Sarat has so wonderfully pointed out in some texts from some years ago. Contemporary art is able to work in ways that we might term extra-disciplinary, in the sense that over the last 20 years, it has successfully sloughed off at least a part of its own disciplinary burden and can encounter other fields with less need for self-justification than is the case for other divisions of knowledge. This advantage, though perhaps small, is significant when it comes to a study such as the former West, in which the general self-understanding of a specific society and its formation is at stake. An extra-disciplinary or an indisciplinary dimension in the form of art that speculates on the uncertainties generated by political and economic change on the ground allows for a space of thinking that might be up to the challenges of this task, or at least to provide the means to represent what is at stake. We believe art is a useful device to measure a more general consciousness of the state of global relationships and to help us collectively think beyond them beyond those relationships, beyond the set patterns that are constantly imposed on us. In this sense, art is more, much, much more than the thing itself, than the artwork itself. But a systemic form of imagining, imagining the world otherwise, from out of the conditions at hand, towards something that is not yet formed. The fact that art resides to some extent in ambiguity, what exactly is its purpose, what exactly is its function, why exactly is it here at all? This is the strength if we want to think about what is not yet formed. And that seems to be the call that Former West, despite all its very necessary rigorous analysis of the last 20 years, needs to bring to bear in order for us to imagine what being Former Westerners, living in the Former West, might actually mean. This imagining must be connected to what has already been imagined and failed. We could call that by some other names, which I think you can imagine from before 1989. But it begins from the ground around it here. In this case, the global effect of the former West, rather than on the basis of nostalgia or any sense that we can rebuild a secure ideology. We are aware that the core universalizing narrative of the West has been transformed both internally and externally through new forms of physical migration, economic exploitation, and post-colonial theory, among other post-1989 shifts. Yet we are still constantly surprised by the adhesiveness of the older paradigms to aesthetic and cultural discourse. The extent to which the idea of a national canon, for instance, has found new purchase in a number of smaller European nations is but one sad but relatively shocking example. In 2009, we're busy with national canons. Didn't we do that in the 19th century? However, the ambivalence of meaning that is often inherent to a successful art artwork, its ability to ask the viewer, ask the viewer rather than interrogate, rather than answer the interrogator, is what can speak to us about the particular conditions of paradox and unawareness that are thrown up by the notion of former West. The agreed definition and appropriate model of art has been itself subject to change throughout the last 20 years. The condition of autonomy, crucial to reviving forms of art that, would, it were, that were independent of the state's need for propaganda in the post-World War II period, became in the course of time a playpen for aesthetic action without consequence outside of itself. And one that has been transformed after 89 with more and more expectations for social performativity from the funders, whether they're sponsors or the, or government or public sector placed on art in return for that sponsorship. Tracking the course of artistic autonomy and investigating how artworks have reformulated it from the condition of the former West can be one of the ways of establishing an artistic narrative over the, next, uh, over the past 20 years, what that narrative of development has been since 89 to now. Art is then proposed as the subject of study as well as the form through which contemporary history can be approached. Looking at the history of art exhibitions and their framing devices since 1945 is also a way to understand the kinds of wider inclusions and exclusions that art makes apparent, so wider inclusions and exclusions on a broader field that art makes apparent, both historically and today. 
The question of Western, Western geographic definition was certainly apparent from the 1950s onwards in, in the promotion of art through, for instance, the promotion of abstract expressionism by the United States government as seen in touring exhibitions of American art, the famous museums of American art, that were sent to Europe, the Middle East, by MoMA in New York under state sponsorship. Western European exhibitions that became defining for conceptualism, such as When Attitudes Become Form in Bern or Blosser Schrube in Amsterdam, both in 1969 or Documenta 5 in 1972, only considered artists from Western territories. Westkunst in Cologne in 1981 at least acknowledged its partial agenda through the title, but then followed it with a section, as you went, walked into the room, called Abstraction, a World Language, which of course only included artists from the West. To confuse us, perhaps, or perhaps out of confused and understandably confused thinking. But that confused thinking could, could exist at a time then, which cannot exist now. Classically, the, in the 1989, in 1982 documenta introduction by um, our, our beloved Dutch curator Rudy Fuchs, he talks of going to Vienna to smell the East. But this world exhibition did not venture further into Europe beyond that experience with the olfactory senses. It is hard to know to what extent these decisions should be understood as in any way deliberate exclusions. I don't think they were personally, but we cannot prove it either way. Clearly, the American art exhibition served a specific purpose, but there was generally a blindness in the West to art from elsewhere, elsewhere except in ethnographic terms. Art beyond democracy's gaze, or the democracy that was defined fairly narrowly in the case of art, or from non-Western cultures, was often not understood as art at all, but more as the product of certain broader cultural conditions. In fact, it was only in 1989, coincidentally, in Paris, that the first flawed but crucial attempt by the mainstream art world to register an idea of global contemporary art took place under, under the title Magician de la Terre in Centre Bobo and La Villette. The year of Mojician was coincidental. It was actually delayed for two years because they wanted it to coincide with the 200th anniversary of another revolution. <laughs> but its presence in France was not. The Biennale de, or, or Biennale de Paris had maintained some links with Eastern Europe and further afield throughout the 1970s, and exhibitions of art from the Francophone colonies and later independent states were more common and taken more seriously in France throughout the post-war period than in any other European country. In this sense, it is interesting that France was still a cultural leader, you could say, up until 89, up until Magician, and its demise as an important site of cultural creation, I would suggest, is perhaps a small part of the story of former West that has yet to emerge. These histories of exhibitions before 89 need to be supplemented by analyses of the less settled exhibition history making over the last 20 years. This tells us much about how and in what ways the formerness of the West came to be manifested in art and its presentation and how art manifested that formerness through its own production. The list must, in, must include but go beyond the major set piece presentations such as the recent documentaries, especially those of 1997 which defined a more inclusive artistic trajectory back to 1968 and of course 2002, which measured the forces of globalization since 1989 and how they impacted on the forms of artistic production. I think 2002 created the possibility for us to observe something that we felt, but we could now see. The reinventions of the traditional Biennale that occurred largely outside the West in the last 15 years have also directed the art world's attention away from the old centers of experimentation and even and have even been imported back to European cities such as Berlin or Liverpool more recently. I think it's interesting to understand the Biennale as we, un as we understand it today is a construction largely of Asia, also of Latin America to some extent with Sao Paulo, but that changed later, but largely of Asia. And that, that construction was then imported back. So what the Biennale means today, whether it's in Berlin or Liverpool, is actually something that was constructed in Istanbul and Guangzhou and in other places through the 90s. There have also been many other smaller scale initiatives, and I talk about initiatives, not exhibitions, that can be collaged together as experimental institutionalism, back of course being one of them, occurring often in provincial cities and in non-Western, or at least non-core Western capital centers. Together, these form a broad front, front on which the shifts in the balance of political and economic power can be traced, and the consequence for the territory of the former West made explicit.
Key to the, to the process of producing former West as a project for us will be the attempt to transform the physical conditions of autonomous juxtaposition, in other words, putting one work next to another in an exhibition, that defines so much of the pre-1989 period to one of entanglement and hybridity, in which origins and lineages are less significant than their, than their immediate interconnections. In undertaking this research and ultimately making an exhibition, we want to bring the conditions of entanglement that the former West is dealing with on an everyday level to bear on the presentation and reception of contemporary art. We can observe this entanglement in the intimate exchanges of experience between cultures on many former Western streets. As Paul Gilroy has eloquently pointed out concerning the African diaspora, it is the condition of hybridity with which we have to come to terms, not the search for original authenticity. And Sarat, I hope, will mention entanglement in passing, but I think entanglement is an incredibly useful term in order to understand this condition of the last 20 years. In and literally the movement from juxtaposition represented by the Berlin Wall to entanglement. In recognizing this, we are required to develop forms of exhibition display and staging that can much match such developments of theory. I think that's a real challenge for us as curators, including Catherine. It is in reflecting on these extended processes of the West, coming to terms with both its historic role and its contemporary displacement from an assumed centrality, as well as constructing modes of address, that art and the exhibition as a medium still have a real relevance to thinking our condition today and creating a space in which the possibility of art to imagine this world otherwise can be laid bare, can be made visible. And I think in thinking about the space of art, I'd like to turn to Maria to talk further. Um, let me move on to the last couple of thoughts. Rethinking the West and its art out, out of their hegemonic self-narration means, in fact, to propose, not without a degree of uncertainty, another view on the history of art after 1989. One that evolves not around the market value of an object, as has become the customary measure, but around significant social and political changes and in dialogue with post-communist and post-colonial thought. While the West and its former state is our subject matter, an approach that to some extent marks it off from elsewhere, we do this in full recognition that the so-called West is a profoundly ambivalent place, always full with the non-West at the very core of its identity. Pursuing an overarching bi a binary of the West versus the rest could not be further from our intent. As it is precisely such here, there are positions that we want to or rather must complicate. What does interest us is how to, from within the so-called West, put limits on the claims that the West has made for its own universalism, having trumpeted its version of liberal capitalism as superior to any other political and cultural ideal. We recognize the necessity to destabilize such a self-depiction of the West and to see how it contributes to narratives across the world from the position of its own provincialism, as well as how the exchanges of consciousness between this part of the world and its outside have changed the characteristics of both. If 1989 is, however symbolically, our starting point, then our inquiry necessarily overlaps with what Boris Groys has termed the post-communist condition, a condition that comes not only after communism but goes precisely beyond it and is a condition that concerns not merely the former communist countries but in fact the world in its entirety. We feel, however, that it is of critical importance to avoid any misunderstanding or possible reduction of our scope of inquiry to the conflict between the post-communist and capitalist parts of the world. The former West is situated within the larger condition of the world in the post-Cold War structure, and thus between different posts, most prominently between the post-communist and the post-colonial. This space between the posts could perhaps be dubbed the post-Cold War condition, the shift through which we believe it is possible to gain a larger view on how the notion of the West has been constructed. Such a synthetic tool could enable us to explore and reject the Cold War, famous three worlds positioning alongside the axis of free slash communist and traditional slash modern, and its ongoing effects, and bid a symbolic farewell 
as Sarat Maharaj did recently with his Guangzhou Triennial in 2008, to both the post-communist and the post-colonial normative horizons. Perhaps this will allow us to better understand the inter in inextricably intertwined global histories of colonialism, communism, capitalism, imperialism, and nationalism, among other isms, and open up a space for thinking the world otherwise. As with a leap of imagination, it might be, after all, that some issues that cannot be resolved through political economy may get entangled in new ways through the space of art. There it is. Thank you for your attention.